welcome to this evening's event. My name is Brianna Sittler. I'm the director of special programs here at Bay Path College. I'm responsible for the Kaleidoscope series, of which this is one of the um, events. And um, I want to ask you to remember to put your phones on vibe or silent. Um, I want to let you know that today's event is sponsored by the Kaleidoscope series and People's Bank. And I, I have to tell you, tonight's event, The Young and the Brilliant, um, with Kevin Rhodes doing Rhodes Talk. This is his first of three here. Hopefully, you'll come back for some of the other um, events that we have coming on. It's very exciting for me. I don't often get music here, and this semester has been full of music. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, Kevin is the music director, the conductor, I can't even begin to say everything, for the Symphony, Springfield Symphony Orchestra. Um, and he's here to interview uh, violin virtuoso Caroline Goulding and play with her. They were practicing earlier. It's absolutely phenomenal. You're going to be blown away. Um, so you're in for an evening of education and relaxation. And at the end of this, there'll be time for question and answer, so you'll be able to talk to them. Um, but with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Kevin to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say, Brianna didn't mention uh, something of which I'm very proud, which uh, goes along with being here at Bay Path this evening, and that is I received uh, my, what I hope is only my first, uh, honorary doctorate from Bay Path last spring. So. <clears throat> It's great to be back at my alma mater. It's, uh, I tell you, the days when I was walking around campus, and uh, it's just all the memories it brings back. Well, uh, it really is uh, quite an honor to have been asked uh, to, uh, to take part in the Kaleidoscope series. And as Brianna said, we have three programs that I'll be doing here over the course of the winter and the spring. Uh, I'll kind of go a little in reverse order. Our last one will be in May, immediately before the final performance of the Springfield Symphony season, and that event will be uh, not in this space. I don't remember where it is going to be, but it's on the information, and that's going to be involving the entire Springfield Symphony chorus, and we're going to be digging into Mozart's Requiem, uh, the uh, last uh, big work that he wrote and didn't actually finish or complete. And uh, then before that, sort of coincidentally, our uh, program in March is going to be focusing on opera before a big opera gala evening that we're doing at the Springfield Symphony. And that brings us then back to tonight. And uh, indeed, the title is The, uh, the Young and the Brilliant. Uh, I worked hard to get that out of my mouth so I didn't say young and restless. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, and sometimes the brilliant are rather restless. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have such a, a fascination with uh, youth in general, I think, but particularly incredibly talented youth, uh, incredibly accomplished youth. And because I think music says so very much, I want to start with uh, just listening to a little bit of music. Um, and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about that. We'll be having Miss Goulding out uh, in just a little bit. But um, as I say, I thought it would be fun to just start with a little music. So sit back and just listen for a few moments. Are we, we all set back there, Greg, with sound? Greg's giving me the thumbs up, all right. <laughs> Let's have a listen. Thank <laughs> you. 
So that lovely bit of music was composed by the nine-year-old Mozart. <laughs> that was young and brilliant. <laughs> that was some incredible genius. And the, um, and the thing that is perhaps <clears throat> at least as amazing as the music, if you think of the idea of this nine-year-old child sitting down and writing these notes and, you know, and not writing uh, just notes for some instrument that he played himself, but writing notes for a voice, you know, because certainly he didn't sing like that, uh, at least at nine, he certainly didn't. Um, and, but yet he was able to, by some means, create a world. And we already hear in this beautiful aria, this concert aria for soprano, uh, that that perfection is somehow already there. The other thing about this work is the text. The text of it was, uh, uh, well, just listen to the first few lines, and because this is, you know, heavy stuff for a nine-year-old. Uh, it, it, the, the first few lines are, oh, I should explain this, the uh, context. It has to do with someone whose lover is away. Stay and remain faithful. Think how I grieve alone here, and sometimes at least remember me. I, I mean, you know, so when you put all of that together, uh, this is really just, as I say, just a truly incredible thing. Now, Mozart was, uh, he only lived to be 35, and perhaps that's part of our fascination with Mozart, the young genius, you know, uh, perhaps if he had lived to be 65 and we had uh, twice as many years worth of music, uh, maybe, maybe it wouldn't have the same mystique, you know, like uh, maybe Marilyn Monroe or James Dean or Elvis, you know, uh, people that die young, they always have a bit of a mystique about them. Um, but I think still, even if he had lived to be 80, a nine-year-old writing that is still somehow very impressive. And uh, Mozart is going to be featured on our program this weekend, and that is indeed no accident, uh, because I wanted to highlight uh, both the, uh, the artists that we have coming, as well as these composers that all sort of fit in this same world of, uh, of uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to say young geniuses, but uh, uh, youthful specialness. How about that? Um, and uh, this weekend, however, we will be playing... Oh, I have a couple other things I want to play for you by Mozart, just to get a little taste. Uh, this work right here is... Um, it's the uh, earliest work of his for which I could find a recording. This comes from when he was five. <laughs> evidently, would play these early works on the piano of harpsichord, and his father would then notate them. Yeah? I guess it helps growing up in a musical family. <laughs> and indeed, you hear it's a very simple but delightfully perfect piece. Uh, if you remember the film Amadeus, uh, I think uh, Salieri would have been glad if he had composed that at 70. Uh, uh, because he never achieved that level of perfection. And indeed, when you listen to this work at five and that other work four years later, it kind of blows the mind, you know, about what happened in terms of his uh, maturity and development. Now, we're going to be playing this weekend his very last symphony. That's the 41st symphony. And uh, that came when he was uh, uh, a mature man of 32. And, uh, and it really is an incredible work. I uh, could spend, you know, three lectures just talking about the first uh, uh, two minutes of that uh, symphony number 41. Uh, but it, uh, it sort of shows this young genius at the real height of his powers. It has, it, it acquired the nickname the Jupiter because it was a really a mammoth symphony for the time, lasting well over half an hour, uh, which was really 
quite unusual at that time. Now, the other composer that's going to be uh, featured both this evening and will be uh, the composer of the concerto, which Ms. Goulding is going to be playing, is Mendelssohn. Now, Mendelssohn was perhaps not quite as precocious as Mozart with uh, composing at five. It, uh, it took him till he was, I think, 12 to write his first symphony, for Pete's sake. Um, uh, but, uh, but let's listen to a little bit of, uh, of our Felix Mendelssohn at 12 writing, indeed, his first symphony for strings. Perfectly nice, very delightful, but somehow I think there is something a little bit more special about Mozart if I were going to be giving a grade on them. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I don't have to give them grades, except to say that they're incredible composers. M Mendelssohn, he made his first public performance at nine already, and uh, uh, he, was, uh, he likewise came into a family in which there was lots of music, lots of culture. Uh, his family had a very uh, cultivated circle of friends. His father would host salons in the house where all of the intelligentsia and artists and so, and so forth would all come together. And so he grew up in this milieu, and perhaps it was a very natural thing for him to uh, begin writing music. And uh, like Mendelssohn, uh, excuse me, like Mozart, he also had a rather short life. Um, did, I didn't, uh, oh my gosh, I didn't do my math here. Uh, so I'm going to have to count how long he lived. 36, uh, 1809 to 1847. Is that 36? Yeah. I'm at a university. Somebody should know. Somebody's got to be smart. <laughs> uh, I, 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 as, as a musician, most of my math uh, stops at uh, six or eight. Um, but um, anyway, uh, so these are the two main composers that will be featured on the program. We also have some Bach to start the evening, and Bach was also uh, could definitely fall into the category of young, brilliant talent. Uh, likewise came into a family of musicians and started composing at a very early age. And uh, rather than necessarily playing you an early piece of Bach or uh, something like that, I think this would be a perfect time for you to get to know our guest artist this weekend. Uh, some t I always think that one of the best ways to get to know an artist is by hearing them perform their art. So I would love for, to ask you to give a big Long Meadow welcome to violinist uh, Caroline Goulding, and we'll hear a little Bach. Oh, Caroline! Hi. Hello. Welcome. I don't know. Greg, is that on? Hello. Okay. Well, I'll just yell. It's <laughs> nice to be here. Um, and we will, I just, I'll, I'm going to play for you a uh, movement from Box Partita number no. three um, in E major, and it's titled Gavat and Rondo. <laughs>
Want to lay your violin down? Yeah. All right. Now let's get uh, let's get ourselves situated here. Drink. Okay. Have drink. Yeah, have a drink. Welcome to my salon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, actually, I was going to offer you, but if, uh, since you've got the bottle in your hand, uh, go for it. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Well, you are the one who's in college, so you're used to having bottles in the hand. Right? Oh, thanks, yeah, right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, only water. Uh, only water. I understand perfectly. So, let's, uh, I, uh, we know each other. We've worked together before. We've even done something similar to, like to this. Yeah. But uh, let's, uh, I would love to let everyone get to know uh, get to know you, right? Not yes. just the performer, okay? So let's, uh, let's start at the very beginning. Where are you from? Where were you born? Um, I'm originally from Michigan, a um, small town bordering Sarnia, Ontario, um, mm. Canada. So I have this accent, um, <laughs> thus the accent. And then um, I moved to Cleveland, Ohio when I was 12 and, and um, went to school there for a while and studied music at the Cleveland Institute of Music. OK, you're getting ahead of me. You're getting ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I got so I, much before okay. that, before we, long before we get to Cleveland and studying music and all that. So um, so, so you, you grew up in this small town. Was, uh, tell me about your family. Were they into music? Um, I have two older brothers, and yeah. they played saxophone and trumpet. And so that's basically how I started. I was three and a half, and they so they were my inspirations. But my parents don't play. Uh huh. So uh, so you so you so in other words, they were playing in school band, right? Right. That's right. And so you said, I, I want to do that too, or what? Um. Actually, I remember I was just fascinated with their instruments, uh, and I saw them practicing in the house and around the house, and um, or play, more playing sing and um I really like I was so interested that one day my brother said to my mom why don't you get her an instrument and um just to have of her own and it was either going to be piano or violin and I'm not sure why I chose violin I think it just I did thank god because I'm not good at piano <laughs> so 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 you have your brother to thank for this that's right wow that's intense that's incredible yeah. are you close uh yeah yeah I'm very close with both of them. So, uh huh. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. They I don't play anymore, but they they still love it. Yeah. So. What do they do? Um, well, one actually is living in Michigan, and um, he's uh, he's working, and the other one is uh, living in South Dakota of all places, and he's a uh, he's a I don't know what this is called. It's like I always think of Smokey the Bear. He's like it's like a a, a, um, a ranger. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a yeah. like yeah, but a forest like from a government. He just got this job. He was in the Air Force for a while. Yeah, and then the government hired him to do um, like forest. 
uh, stuff. Stuff. Forest yeah, stuff. I'll just say he goes that. out and we, he he yeah. he watches the forest. That's right. He makes sure everything's. He patrols that. Okay. Patrols okay. okay. Well, and um and so you say your parents weren't into music at all. Were right. they? Uh, were they? Uh, did they listen to music? Did they have the classical station on at home or yes. not even that? Okay. Yes. They did have that. They uh, enjoy classical music very much. So. Okay, and so now uh, was the move to Cleveland? No, well, no, no, no. I don't want to get to Cleveland yet. I still, I still want to stay in Michigan. Uh, and I, and I'm, and I drive through this town all the time. Uh, and I'm, and I'm just, I'm, I, I cannot come up with the name of the town across from Sarnia. Port Huron. Port Huron. Oh my God. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I know where it is. Yeah. Uh, it's in but, the uh, right, 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 right. It's where you come across there, and you yeah. can go to Detroit or the, or the Port right. Huron uh, Sarnia right. thing. Yes. Oh, I know it. I know. It. I know Michigan. Um, now, uh, so so you. Uh, so what age did you begin playing? Uh, three and a half. I was three and a half. Three and a half. And so it was that was uh, in, in what kind of a situation was that? We, we, we looked in the newspaper. We found a teacher, uh, right. found you a little violin. That's right. It was just kind of a thing where I believe um, they did look in the newspaper or something. I think it was just kind of um, like a random how we found this teacher. I'm not really sure. I just know that she was she traveled to the area from um, where she was had where she was from in Detroit. Excuse me. And so she traveled there and um, once a week. And so she was the only teacher. She was great, though. I had her for about seven and a half years. Oh, so right. I studied with her for about seven and a half years. Yeah, now that sounds like my first piano teacher. My, my mom looked in the newspaper, too. That's, wow. why, I, that's why I said the newspaper, because yeah. she, she looked and she found, uh, I think she found the cheapest one she that's could find. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and in my case, that happened to be the youngest one. That's she, she was 16. Mine was oh, when wow. I started with it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, whoa, is right. I had a terrible crush on her. And, uh, and that always helped my motivation oh, for yeah, practicing absolutely. because I didn't want absolutely. to play badly, right? Exactly. That's and, you know, she went and married her boyfriend anyway. Oh, you know, uh, you know, you were probably too young. I, you know, but I didn't see it that way. Yeah. I, 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 I was, I was uh, 10 or 12 when she got married and crushed, you know. Oh, uh, that's you awful. know, I'm so sorry. well, I've it happens, been you know, the life of an artist. Yeah, yeah, the that's life, the of, life an of an That's right. Yeah. That's right. It, 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 so, okay, so you had the great teacher. Now then. You play music better now. Because oh, of that. because of that, absolutely. You put it in your music. Well, well, you know, it, it, it is. Things are always better once you've gone through a struggle. That's right. Oh, if absolutely. it just comes easy, then pain. right, pain is important. That's true. It is right. Otherwise, how can we bring it out in the music? Absolutely. Oh, that's it. Now, so you, uh, so the family moves to Cleveland, and is that when you uh, have to find a new teacher, or had you already yes. found one at home? Okay. Uh, well, I, uh, so I had studied with this teacher for seven and a half years, and then. I started studying with this um, with Paul Cantor at University of Michigan. Oh, okay. Um, when I was about nine. All um, right. Now, so so let's uh, let's back up. Paul Cantor is a very very respected name in uh, in violin teaching. Also, as right. a, as a as a violinist, I forget which orchestra he was concertmaster of for I many years. I can't remember either, which is bad. I had him for eight years, so I should know this. But yeah, I, but I, he I was concertmaster of the big concert orchestra as one of the faculty when I was a student in Aspen. Maybe, I remember. Well, yes, years. he was in he's. He's still in Aspen, and now oh, yeah? he's at he, now he's in Texas. But originally, I started. He was at U of M, and then mm -hmm. he moved to Cleveland, mm -hmm. and so then I also moved to Cleveland to continue studying with him. Uh huh. So um, okay. And, and you know, my parents were very dedicated and supportive, of course. And they yeah, me. yeah. Let's and hear then, about that. So your parents moved house so you could be with the right teacher. That's right, which is very de that that's very great. I, you know, that's that's. Nice. I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> now, now, do you now? You, you know, of course, we all don't know all of the conversations that go on between our parents. Thank God. Uh, but uh, do, do you have any idea how that worked? Uh, was it just sort of something uh, well, they both they, thought of, or? Well, yeah, and also they're both special education teachers, so it was, um, you know, pretty uh, easy for them to find job positions because it's such a. Um, it's a field where you know you can pretty much well knock on wood. I mean, well, unfortunately, you can go anywhere, and, and there are there there's are, always a there's need. need. There's yeah. always a need. Absolutely, right. and so they were they were educators themselves. Right. So they understood the even if they weren't musicians, they understood the value of education and education right. for you at this point in your right. life uh, in a way that maybe you know somebody else with a different profession might not. Right. 
Oh, that's that's they very. They could do that. They were able to do that. So. Yeah, well, you know, I uh, I want to ask you to do a, a little uh, in, in, in this a little show and tell, just because I'm fascinated. So this is for me, folks. I don't know if it's interesting to you, but it's going to be interesting for me. What do you do when you start violin lessons? I do you, have no idea. You don't remember? I don't remember. You don't remember? Um, I don't. I mean, I all I know is I probably pract I didn't even. Pra I probably went in and I played like one note, I guess. They taught us the open strings. That's probably what it was. Oh, and my very first song was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. That was part of the Suzuki method. Right. So everybody begins with Twinkle, Little Star. Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Now, and and can, can you play? You know, you can't play that on open strings, yeah? You've got to press down. Well, no, you can play that on, well, you have to press down on like one or two fingers. Can you show us? Okay. I even love simple music. I love all music. Yeah, well, let's explain. An open string is where she doesn't press her finger onto the string to make it short. So the string is open. So. Ah, uh, there went a finger. Yeah. There was a finger. Yeah. Another finger. Another finger. And then. Ah. Uh. I mean, you know, because we didn't use four, I don't think. We just did open. Uh. Because you can also go instead of it's the same note, only on a different string with a fourth finger. Mm -hmm. So, but you, you know, first they teach you because fourth is the weakest finger, you know. So first they teach you one, one, two, three. So you can because it's hard already. This position is so awkward that it's like they try to, but. That's why there's so many. That's why the you know the fourth finger is usually weak, the weakest one. Right. Well, and the and the and the uh, the, 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 the 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 fourth finger is it joined with the third or the fifth? I forget. Uh, it's no, the third is joined with the second. Right. So the the fourth is joined with. I think it's the fourth and the fifth are joined together in in oh, the no, musculature. Oh no! What I'm saying is the fourth is. Oh, sorry. What I meant I'm was the musculature. minus the thumb. This is the fourth finger, the pinky. That's what oh, I meant. Oh, that's right. The that's pinky. your four. Yeah, yeah, that's my oh, four. Oh, piano four is Sorry, little finger. Sorry, okay. it's confusing. Your four is my five. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I meant was the pinky. We don't, it's weak, you know. But this one is okay. This uh -huh. one is, I don't know why. That's yeah, well, you know, we don't like to trill on the piano five four, you know. Yeah. That, that's something you really got to work on. That's awful. Uh, Me too. Yeah, okay. Too. Okay. Well, so, so, so the lessons are starting. They're moving along, and you go in to uh, study with this revered uh, master teacher, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Cantor. And so did you know what you were, did you properly? realize what you were doing when you went in to play for him the first time no I had no idea I yeah. mean we were at that point you know I was so young and I didn't really know anything about like about him at that point or what even if even if I did know about like read about him I wouldn't know it wouldn't have affected right me, you know what I mean what, say okay he did a lot of stuff or, okay yeah, so right. um but he, but um which was probably good. Oh, yeah. Because I went in and, I mean, I was definitely nervous, you mm -hmm. know. Do you remember what you played first lesson for I him? I believe so. I believe I played Act Like Violin Concerto. Like, um, so it was just, and at that point I was just, um, I think I was just excited to learn, to learn something new, which, mm -hmm. I mean, hasn't changed. I mean, I still am excited to learn. But at that point it just, I, I remember I had, um, become very close with my other teacher, and I studied with both of them for a while, Miss mm. Julia and Mr. Cantor. I studied with both of them for a smoother transition for mm -hmm. a year and a half. Um, I believe I studied with both, or like maybe a year, or so and then to make the transition. But um, uh, yeah, and then I and then I decided just to when he would move to Cleveland, that's when I decided to move over there. Right. So. And 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 how old again when this move I took was, place? Um, well, at that point. I was about 11, uh -huh. so I had started studying. I had been studying with him for, um, for those two years. Mm -hmm. so now, nine, ten, yeah. now by this point at 11, um, had you done any things like uh, taken part in any competitions? Um, uh, be, been part of some larger things than than your your private violin study? Well, I um, I believe I yeah I played. I remember I. I played my first um, concerto. I played my first concerto um, when I was about nine, uh -huh. and then I also did. What was, I what was to, it? What was it? I think it was Act Like. You think or it was Bach, that one? And then it was uh, no, no, no. I did some. I did Bach concerto, the first movement. You know, mm -hmm. when I was about eight, and then I did 
something at nine. But then that summer, I went to Interlaken, mm -hmm. and I had won the concerto competition there. Right. And then I did the I did, and then I also played. I had yeah, I did a little performances like Preludium and Allegro, and like at the big you know auditorium there for their collage concert, which was right. a big deal for me. You oh know, it was gosh, really yes, absolutely. For, it was exciting, and I was so nervous and. Um, and then, and then the next summer, uh, I did the Mozart concerto and beat number one oh, in B super. flat major in, in at Interlaken. And so those two things were really like exciting for me at the time, which was, uh, and then, and so the things were progressing and then I, and then DSO, I remember Detroit symphony. Mm -hmm. I, um, I went to play for them and I was in their youth orchestras for a while when I was about nine around that age. And okay. then I, uh, they needed a little person to play for a young people's concert. Yeah. And they, uh, so I remember I played for the conductor there and he said, uh, he said, why not play the, th uh, I believe I played the third moon of Mendelssohn concerto when I was about 10 right uh, with the DSO and that was the first time I played the third movement and uh, it was with the DSO and I, I couldn't believe it and I was just starstruck I was so nervous and I was so excited and um, yeah it was it was a, just a magical experience and that's and then right after that I moved to Cleveland right so wow so so indeed you had all you you were you were already in the world of a um, budding young performer. Well, maybe, yeah. Let's I had say. no idea what I was doing. Right. I mean, I just well, you know, you, well, you, well, you absolutely were. You were taking part in these very high-level summer events, playing in the big, serious youth orchestra of Detroit Symphony, being asked to solo with the symphony and the youth concerts. So, uh, so already the path the was canoe. laid. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sort of. I, I was more, um, like, interested in, uh, I remember at Interlochen, I was more interested in, um, like the s'mores and the and mm -hmm. the uh, other things. I don't think I got very much practicing done there. But you know, I did meet somebody that made a huge impression on me, and her name was Annie Chalix, and she was a wonderful teacher. And that was when I was also making the transition from my earlier teacher to Paul Cantor, and she really opened the door. And I remember she was really tough on me. And yeah. Which I, I mean, yeah, she was really tough on me, <laughs> and, I, and I just still didn't practice. I mean, but still, yeah. but she, she still some of the techniques that she taught me. Mm -hmm. I still use today, actually. I'm not that I think about it. Some of the um, practicing techniques, uh -huh. things like that. So, yeah, I've had a lot of help. Now, uh, so up to this time, you've already played a lot of pieces. Uh, do you, do you, uh, th this is a, a, bit, a bit of a strange question, and, and I will admit that I always hate when I get asked questions that are of this variety, but <laughs> do, you, uh, do you remember the first piece that you played that, you could say you loved. Yes, I um, I believe it was Mendelssohn. Isn't that funny? Or or Mozart or Mozart first concerto. It was it could have been Mozart first concerto. I think was the first you one I Mozart. really loved. Yeah. Um, and I still and it's funny because I always come back to Mozart whenever somebody says what's your favorite composer. I say Mozart, and oh, and Beethoven of course. But um, but I Mozart. Yeah. So it's really interesting that maybe it had an impression uh, well, of course uh, at an early age, and so then. Do you have any, could you put it into any kind of words, what it was that you loved about it? Just the joy that it emitted. I, and I still love Mozart because of the joy that it emits. And just the beauty and the purity and the just, it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it's so operatic and so bubbly and so snappy. And I just like that personality that he has and that, that particular personality um, that he emits, I guess, mm -hmm. through his music. I mean, even I mean, of course, it's not all happy and joyous. I mean, it's it's also very tragic and in some ways, but there's always some kind of light to it. It's uh, or maybe I don't know. It's just a particular preference. Of there's a thing. It's yeah, a, thing. a thing. It's, it's a, a thing. thing. You can't. Yeah. It's hard to put it's words on the thing. It's a personality thing. Yeah, oh a, yeah, it comes know. through in every note. And I and I, I don't know if you could hear backstage, yeah. but I was playing these couple little clips of uh, some pieces that he wrote when he was five and nine. And the thing is already there. Absolutely. It's, it's already there. And, and I found it particularly in that vocal piece. Um, now, let's take this to the other end of the thing. Did you ever get a piece in these, in these initial years that you just hated? You said, oh, gosh, why'd you assign me this thing? And, oh, I hate practicing it and whatever. Um, Did you ever have any of those? Well, no, because I remember when I... When I oh, probably when I was y much younger, I just did not like that. There was one book, one piece in the Suzuki method called uh, 
I don't even know what it was called. It was awful. I just did not <laughs> want to do it. It was just, I kept having to go back to it. It was awful. Um, but, but when I got to Mr. Cantor, he did something that usually most teachers didn't and let basically let me call the shots about what pieces I wanted to do. So how did you I know what him, to choose? How did well, you know I, I loved, chose what I loved. I brought him, I remember the Pagnini Concerto D major okay. when I was nine. I don't know what I was thinking. This concerto is so difficult. And, and, I, and I said, can I learn this? And of course, he, he was like, well, sure, yeah, you can learn it. <laughs> I mean, and, and, but I did it, but it was so hard. It was so hard, but, it, but uh, you know, and he just let me do whatever. Right. I mean, and still, now to, even now, my teacher now, Mr. Weilerstein, I've been studying with for a couple of years at NEC. You haven't gotten to that part. Yes, I know. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> he, but he, uh, he lets me do, you know, but at this point, I guess they, they expect you should kind of know what you have to do. So. Right, 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 right. The, the, the advantages of uh, right. being older. Yeah. <laughs> and the disadvantages. Uh, right. You have to do, start be, taking responsibility, yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> do you remember anything about your first performance? Um, no, but I remember a memorable moment that inspired me to want to do this for a living and play music for a living, which was when I heard, well, my, one of my favorite violinists was Isaac Stern, and um, I still listen to him, and I remember he came to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and he played, uh, there was an opportunity for him, he played with 100 young uh, children, uh, the Bach Double Concerto. I mean, like, it would say age, from age seven to, I think I was six or seven when I played. And a hundred of us stood on the stage with him. We played Bach Double with him. Wow. And it was a kind of, I think it was like a, um, of course, it was an honoring celebration of, of his legacy, I think, or mm -hmm. something like that at Hill Auditorium. And, and that experience was just inspiring for me because I had just really loved, listen, I always, heard, um, you know, listened to his recordings and things mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, yeah I remember that. I can I can first. I can see remembering that yeah. I can see remember being there on stage and so this was uh, even though it, it wasn't just you and Isaac uh, right. nevertheless uh, uh, this was probably the first time you were really in the presence of a musically of an artist like right. this That's right, right. Uh, that that comes with just the whole you know of course the whole reputation but also yeah. that that thing that these guys yeah. have that yeah. you, it's, uh, again it's hard <laughs> to put your finger on what exactly it is right. Um, now uh, let's uh, uh, so so, uh, so we, uh, let, let's get, let's 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 finish high school. Now during all of this, are you just going to regular school? Uh, I am taking private courses through. Um, no, I mean when you're in high oh, school. When I was in high school. Okay, yes. Sorry. I, I mixed um, my tests. Yes, I there. did. Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. I pl I went to a school in Cleveland, uh, in Gates Mills, Ohio, called Gilmore Academy. And um, that was, I did that. And um, I didn't go to a music school. I went to, a, that was a private school. It was a private school, but it was, um, it was mostly, it was all academic. And, um, you know, they had a huge sports program too. So no music. Nah. And did, did you do any of that? No, I didn't have time. Don't, I was, you know, who wants to break a finger, yeah, that's true. you know? But I had friends that were on like, you know, the hockey and the swim teams and the, yeah. They had girls hockey too. It was yeah. Intense. Did you yeah. want to do girls hockey? No, kinda? no. Oh, okay. No, but I. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, but I, I really, you know, I wanted to maybe do cross country. I think. Uh huh. That would have been fun. Yeah. I just didn't though. Okay. Well, you can't do it all. Yeah. You can't do it all. So, so, um, what? At what point uh, did you win uh, your your first? Competition, if you will, uh, the, uh, the competition of some you know m meaningful significance. Um, well, I didn't. I didn't. I haven't um, done many huge. Com well, no, I haven't done any huge competitions like international competitions, um, because I felt always never a, a necessity to do one yet because I've had all these goals lined out for me already, um, performance goals. So, I mean, the ultimate reason why I would, or anyone does a competition really in, in my kind of field is to, set, first of all, for a goal and also to, you know, to gain, you know, maybe exposure or performances or in things like that if, if you do win and also just to, to set a goal for oneself to improve. 
So I've always had nat. I've always had other things that have kind of been my goals, which have been performances and things like that, which I, I prefer actually. Mm -hmm. I hate hate competition, but um, they're, they're pretty miserable. Yeah, they're very. I'm miserable. sure. I I'm, I have friends that have done them, and it's yeah, it's very difficult. But um, I did do one. I did do uh, one competition in Aspen. I mean, one of the ones that were was a bigger one. I did was the Aspen concert. Uh, the Aspen music festival concerto competition and um that one was successful i mean i had done i had done one the year before and um and they have one every year and they do you know different concertos each year you do, they say select a concerto and then you know you play it and then everybody plays the same one and then they pick which person it's you know um so that one i did and that one was a great um that was a success and that was a really fun thing because when you win you get to perform with one of the orchestras in aspen which is a great opportunity and it's a great orchestra and it's a great uh you know for exposure and things like that so that was nice how old were you then i was 13. you were 13. I was 13. and the piece Mendelssohn. <laughs> all right, all right, good. We have a running theme here, Mendelssohn and Mozart. Uh, you, you would think we had talked about this before. No. Uh, no. Now, um, now, of course, at some point along the way, and I think we must be getting close to the time, you begin to get engagements to play concertos with orchestras around the country. How did that all start? Um, well, I just, it started small and grew, and it's been a natural progression since, um, just, it's been a natural, um, occurrence, just, I mean, it, it's kept, it's kept going, knock on wood. Did an, did an, did an agent, so, no. yeah, yeah, or my head, just, that also yeah. works for wood. Uh, did you, did, 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 an, did an agent find you, hear you, and then start saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah there's this great young gal, that, you know, to bring her to Philadelphia, bring well, her to wherever? Or I did do, I did an audition, so I did do, a, it's a competition. I mean, I did do one big competition, it's called Young Concert Artists, and um, that was one, in 2009, I did that, mm -hmm. I believe. It was 2009, and I won that. And that it's not an it's not a competition. It's an audition where they can select how many ever they would like. Is you know sometimes they select only two people, sometimes they select five or six. It just depends um, if they think you know what they think about the year and everything and the judges and things. So that is what it is. It's a small. It's kind of like a baby management company so it's like it's not big league management but it's it's like a kind of a step in that direction and they um they do manage you for years and it is exposure basically so you have debuts in in new york and boston washington dc and in recitals and then you do um smaller venue performances and things like that and then in addition to that i you know I, somehow i was just um other things fell into place, and I also had some perform some bigger performances, you know, because I lived in Cleveland, and then, you know, I did a Cleveland Orchestra Young People's Concert there, and other things came in alongside of that, which always helps, and then, and then you know, the, the key is to get the invite back. That's kind of the, the thing. I mean, you can be invited. That's, that's uh, I remember Miss Dorothy DeLay used to always say, I remember my teacher told me, uh, when whenever a student went to her and said, you know, I'm playing with the Chicago Symphony, you know, she would say, that's great, sweetie. But the real, no, no, she would, she didn't say that's great. She said something like, um, that, you know, that's nice, sweetie. But what, what would be great is if you get the when you get the invite back, or if you get the invite back. <laughs> so it's you know, you get, it's very it's great to have the debut. But the point is to make a lasting career. You you keep keep people happy so. right eventually you run out of yeah. first times at exactly. places right, eventually the yeah point. That's you know right. there, there there is a finite number right. of it right. so now um now at some point here you it must have been time to decide to go to college yes uh university and and how did you go about choosing a place the teacher uh -huh. it's really ultimately the teacher and i um i had studied with my teacher in cleveland and in michigan paul Cantor, for eight years and that's a long time um, a lot of people study with teachers probably four years tops, and then they and then they go on to another one. I mean, and then some people also. There are some people that have studied with the same one for life. I mean, so it just depends. It depends on how you are, how you're feeling, and everything. So I really did feel like it was time to go. It was time to just learn something new and um, do different things. So I I heard about uh, I didn't know what I was going to do and then I heard about um, I had been hearing about Mr. Great things about Mr. Weilerstein for a long time, and um, 
and I decided to have a lesson with him. I was also applying to, uh, you know, to Juilliard. I, I had applied to Juilliard for Mr. Perlman's studio mm-hmm. originally, and I was going to have a lesson with him. Uh, and you know, basically, what you do is you take lessons with with people before you you go to, before you audition, and then you know who you really like and who you work with well. It's very it's it's a very personal because it's one on one, so you, it's very important this it's, part. It's of like it. a blind date. It is. It is right. It is and, like a blind and, date. You see I mean, how the blind date goes, that's and right. then you decide that's if right. there's going like to be a, a second date. That's right. Yeah, if you're going to go right. steady. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because if it doesn't go well, forget it. Yeah, we forget it. You're right. We don't want that. That's right. So you never and you never know. Some great teachers and. Some students uh, that are some teachers that are very popular don't click, and then you know, and some some people that are never heard. Of, it just you never know. So who knows? So what? Uh, different strokes for different folks. Um. So I so I went to have this lesson. Um. In the meantime, I had you know tr- had a couple lessons with a few other teachers, and I you know I kind of like them. I mean I, I like them, but I haven't hadn't really you know thought about who I wanted to study with yet. And then I went to Mr. Weilerstein, and it was so funny because I had not uh, really thought. I mean, I just kind of went in. I didn't even. Somebody had set up the lesson, and I didn't really think was wasn't really thinking about it. I was kind of uh, at that point. I didn't know what to do. I was confused, whatever. So I, I just thought, okay, I'll try it. I'll try it. I'll try it. I, I was in that attitude, and I really liked it. And I didn't expect it. You know, I was saying, I was saying to myself, I'm going to apply to Mr. Perlman. I'm going to do this. You know, I was all, you know, set for this. But it's funny how, it's strange how life works like that. You oh, know, yes. it's, it was very unexpected and I clicked very well and we clicked very well. And so then I didn't even, um, I didn't even end up applying for Mr. Perlman anymore after that. Uh-huh. I just, I immediately switched to, because I really liked him and I really liked what I was learning and yeah. So it's working out. The who needs it, Zach? No, know, no, he's great. I, that. I think he's amazing. I <laughs> yeah. think he's amazing. But. but, but you found. But the point but is, found you found the, you found yeah. the chemistry that clicked. That's right. And that is that's that's, right. that's the most important thing. Absolutely. And yeah, and. Uh, but I still really love Mr. Perlman too. So. Uh, well, of course, of course. Well, who does? Who, who does it? Yeah. Who does? That's who true. does it? Now, um, so now, how long have you been? Uh, how long have you been over there in Boston at um, uh, the conservatory? This is my second year there. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, so it's been it, it's been great. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I'm still going. So. I so now let's let's talk a little bit about trying to balance all of these things because you've got a lot of things to balance. Uh, you are not just going to school and waiting till you've got a diploma to go look for a job and uh, anything that isn't class time is party time. Uh, that's not, that's not what, how it's going for you. You have a job. You have a big job uh, yeah. going and performing. How many, um, how many uh, concert dates do you do per year now? Can you t- put a number on it? Um, I, I, you know, I would say, well, this month I was my busiest month, to be honest. And this is, um, the, I was busy every weekend. So I've had four orchestra engagements this month, which is a lot because it's every weekend I've been gone. Um, usually it's two per month, which is a good, great number. Um, one, like one, that's a good number to shoot for is two, two per month. Um, but sometimes there are months with nothing, like with nothing, I mean, not really, but some sometimes. But like coming up, I, February. What I'm saying is February. I think I don't have. I think I have a lot of auditions and things. So, uh-huh. moments, but but um, but then then some months there are like four things. So it just depends. But. Right, and so and 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 this is just such a different thing than. Uh, oh yeah, I'm in school and uh, you know I'm gonna play on my friend's recital in the music auditorium uh, on uh, you know on Wednesday or something. You know, right. you're going and playing big significant concertos, even if it's only two a month, uh, if it's a slow month, right? Uh, so, so this is a lot of balancing right. between being prepared for your concert engagements right. and, and your lessons. If I know the kind of teachers that you're talking about here, right. uh, it's not like they're gonna be content to hear you pl- come in and play Mendelssohn every week for your concert engagement. They want, <laughs> they want to hear something else because you know Mendelssohn, right? Well, it's, well <laughs> the thing is, uh, Actually, um, it, I was just talking about this, my teacher. It, it would be great to be able to play a concerto more than once for a lesson and then bringing in a new piece the next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's usually, um, I mean, 
uh, usually, you know, you, you work on a piece and you get the first layer with the with the teacher and then and then you work on a second layer of the piece the next week and then you work on, you know I for my friends that are that are in school and things like that but um because of the this uh because of you know I've had to prepare different things and things like that I um you know you I bring in Mendelssohn one week and then the next week I bring in Sibelius and the next week I bring in Beethoven the next week so I mean in a way that's great because you're learning different things but at the same time it's all the first layer yeah so uh in other words you don't you don't thank you you don't um you don't get to that so so uh what I'm saying is I guess what I'm saying is that you have to I guess prioritize or something i'm which i'm learning right now the hard way oh yeah um, yes <laughs> so, um, what do you mean the hard way well uh, ha ha have you i had say yes to everything let's just say that okay so um no i mean i've learned i i love to play and i love to perform and and i love to say yes to school and yes to film noir class and yes to this class and yes to that class but um you know time is very important and i it's something it's vital and um, prioritizing is is very vital. So, um, yeah. So I've I'm I'm finished. I'm graduating this year from like my uh, undergraduate diploma uh, at NEC. But um, and then next year I'm hoping I'm auditioning right now for um, a, basically I'm auditioning for a program that there are no class requirements. Um, oh, I like that. Just <laughs> um, right. Just. Uh, private lessons which is mm -hmm. ideally what would be great for me uh mm -hmm. at this point so that's good oh for yeah my schedule um and uh because you know the the other thing too of course about all of this is, and uh this is really something is is the travel right. involved in getting to your engagements right you know, I mean, uh, this is a relatively easy thing. You That's know, a right. couple this hours in the car with a driver, and then you're here, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, when you've got to make three connections, uh, then this must really start eating. And re and the concerts on the weekend, the rehearsals. So y your week must get very compact. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're home, and then for two days, I have a lesson. Mm -hmm. I have a couple lessons, <laughs> and then um, and then you then you go again. But but I'm used to it. I love traveling. You know, I mean. I hate airports, you know. I mean, unless they're empty, that's great. Um, but yeah. which I'm sure you guys can relate to. But um, but then, but I love traveling, and I love you know doing this this uh, this kind of. I love performing, of course, and doing all of this. It's just finding a balance between doing school and doing uh, this that has been that has been the difficult part. And I mean, I'm slowly but surely getting through it, but. It's it's you know taking some some time so to yeah yeah get used to it yeah <laughs> but hopefully next year will be looking like a more yeah. next uh, year will be, be looking more, more like a more civilized civilized yeah. lifestyle uh, and um, that's oh I've already talked about that oh I've already talked about that let's uh, yeah. let's talk about your violin okay uh, now th let me let me just just set the background here for for the audience the uh, you know uh, pianists of course you know we go wherever we go and there's a Yamaha there's a Steinway there's a Baldwin you play what's there but of of course instrumentalists uh, they they have their instruments that they carry around and play take with them uh, you know clarinets are one thing trumpets are another thing uh, but of course violins are something altogether different uh, because you know w w one thing we do know and I think this is perhaps common knowledge it seems like for the most part the best ones are older ones um, yeah I don't want to say um, that there aren't great contemporary violins because there are I mm -hmm. mean there are great contemporary makers Griner and things like that um, I mean, and, and people like that, um, that that are making instruments that are great. Um, but also, you know, um, the older instruments, I'm saying from the 1700s and the late 1600s, um, mid 1600s, uh, are also very valuable and um, beautiful because they're, of course, they're works of art. It'd be like, contemporary art versus you know something from that period which is adds value to it I mean essentially right now so now yeah. and and of course when you started you had a little teeny violin um, yes I did and w how old were you when you got your first full-sized violin uh, I was uh, 
like nine, I think. Yeah. I think so. Or maybe a little older, 11. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 11. And then the next one? 11. Yeah. So then you, so then you get your first full size one. And then when, when's the first upgrade? Uh, <laughs> my first time that I played a wonderful, uh, 1617 Brothers Amadi ex Lapkowitz, it was called. And it was when I was thir 14, I received it. Or maybe th 13. Now explain that to us. When I received it. Oh, yeah, yeah. When so I received it. That's, I don't a, that, that's very cryptic. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't own it. I mean, I didn't own it, and I still don't own the one that I play. Um, it was from a wonderful organization in Chicago called Stradivari Society. And it's this... Uh, it's this organization that sponsors, um, basically, well, they have these this co wonderful collection of old instruments, um, and they're from often they're Cremonese, most most of them from Cremona, Italy, in the 1600s, 1700s, and they loan them out to people that they uh, that you know that they know will perform perform on them, and uh, because of course it's also important for these instruments to be played on for their uh just for their value to 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 keep so um it's very important for the wood and for the vibration of the wood and just the, the sound of the instrument to uh yeah to to be able to sound that great yeah well, you, well, you don't you don't want to leave a great car in the garage that's either. right you know that's right now uh, what uh, in what sort of price uh, value, I, uh, price is maybe the wrong word to use, in what sort of value range would most of those instruments have laid? They, I don't know the specifics, but they're very, very, very expensive, I can tell you. And um, Are we into seven digits? Yes. Right. Okay. So, uh, so, <laughs> so. It, it's it's clear even even with parents who will move, uh, so you can study that we aren't necessarily purchasing a seven-digit instrument for you to play. Absolutely. And so <laughs> organizations like this uh, are really crucial. They loan them for you know a year. This is a yearly contract, but then I had that one for about four years. And and so what about the violin that you're playing now? Well, after that, then I played on a, a Stradivarius. For couple years and then now I play on um well I mean I I just started playing on so I've had I had the Strad for 1720 beautiful general kid it was for until um October November I think of this year November mm -hmm. and I just started playing on a one that I like better I like this one it's part of the Stradivari Society again and but it's uh it's an Amati it's another Amati but it's a Nicolo 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 Amati and it's 16 Thirty-seven forty to forty, mm -hmm. so, uh, and it's beautiful. I like. I love it. Um, it has a lot of character, and it's much. It's very different than the previous one. That's also beautiful. That I the, the Strad, but it's um and the Strad is so beautiful and so pure and so um like like a bullet, mm -hmm. but this one is more kind of round and interesting. Very interesting sound. So. How long does it take to get kind of comfortable with with a new violin? Is oh, it? Oh, I'm still getting. No, it's not. I mean, I'm still getting used to it. You think this was a very natural chemistry that I had with this one, but I'm still getting uh, to know it and learning it and knowing how to produce the best sound on it right. because it is temperamental. It's more temperamental than the Strat. Oh but well, you, well, yeah, you know, I mean, and instruments really have absolute characters. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, and uh, you treat them the wrong way, they don't like it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, what do you say we uh, we get back to that uh, instrument there and uh, treating it well? And uh, why don't we play a little Mendelssohn for the people sure. since we've been talking about Mendelssohn sure. so much tonight? All right. Yes, Brianna. <laughs> With this weather, too. Yeah, the weather, the room, yes. All right? Uh, yeah, hang on. Let me just...
that was fun. That was really fun. That was fun. That was fun. Now, something I, 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 you know, we were just talking, of course, about the violin and and its and 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 its uh, properties and whatever. And for those of you who will uh, come on Saturday evening to Symphony Hall, uh, and by the way, I believe we have some sort of uh, ticket offer in your uh, uh, going on tonight. Where, where, where's someone from my orchestra? Somebody? Yes, Renato. We've got vouchers. We've got vouchers. We got them. They got them. Oh, good. Okay. But what I wanted to say was, in uh, our Symphony Hall, by the way, I don't. You probably don't know this yet. Is uh, was built by the same architect who built Boston Symphony Hall, I heard that. and it is basically the same building. That's uh, That's yeah. Wonderful. And you will. And and it's and it's always so amazing. Uh, what and I always like to point out how lucky we are to have this symphony hall here uh, because you know this little tiny room you know is just a little you know a fraction of the space but oh my god how this violin will sound different in that place than in this little carpeted room yes, yes. yeah wood is good yeah. Yeah, wood is good wood That's is good right. we like wood well I um, yeah, yeah 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 please yeah, yeah, yeah. ah that's it that's it <laughs> now uh, I, I, I just want to take one moment before we open it up for questions, uh, and that is a little while ago uh, in the course of explaining things, uh, Caroline mentioned, uh, well, she's from Michigan, of course, but also mentioned studying at Interlaken. Uh, which, if, is, if, if you all don't know, Interlaken is, well, it's two things. It's a big summer festival academy, and it's also a year-round boarding school. Now, you didn't take part in the boarding school, right? Year-round. Uh, but this is the place where my other orchestra is. Uh, Traverse City is the, the larger town, the big city, right? Uh, right, right there. <laughs> but, uh, but Interlaken is right there, and the, the, many of the faculty, most of the faculty play uh, the principal positions in my orchestra out there. And for, uh, he's just retired now I don't know if you knew that that Ed has just finally retired yes, I did, though. I didn't yeah that. and uh, my executive director there for the past five years had been the director of the Interlochen Academy for many many years and indeed was present when you uh, had this uh, this debut what was it 11 again or was that nine, nine. that was a nine-year-old one right yeah. and uh, and a few years back uh, he said oh there's this great violinist that I, you know, she was at the academy and whatever, got to bring you two together to work. And, and he did, and that was just delightful. And it was just such a great time. And I have, uh, uh, am so excited that you're now here coming to Springfield and uh, to play with us here. And we'll be uh, seeing each other again later on in May. That's right. It's in May, right? I yes. I believe it's in I May. Think it's in I May. think it's in May. I th it feels like Playing May. Beethoven. Yes, yeah, so we're going to be doing the Beethoven Concerto later on this year. I'm really looking forward to that. Me too. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, so it's just fun how these uh, wonderful little connections at one point in life then at a different point in life come produce something else exactly. completely unexpected right, right. Uh, because it's entirely possible that your name might not have come across my radar yeah. uh, in that same sort of way as right. with Ed and uh, it's just great well do we have any questions from it, from people out here in the house all right well I saw your hand first ma'am so uh, uh, and I think uh, oh Brianna's going to do the Phil Donahue thing and run around with a microphone <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, I love it. Yes? I was just wondering about your bow. If you could tell us anything oh, about sure. the bow, and the do you bow, own the bow? Yes, the bow is a Dominique Picot, and I do. I, I own the bow in the case. Um, it's, but I, that was also a present to me. It's very, the bows are very expensive, can be very expensive. This one in particular was very expensive. But it's a beautiful bow, and uh, Dominique Picot, it was a very famous uh, bow maker living in the 1800s. And the two premier bow makers of that time, and well, of the modern bow, was Tourt and then Picot, the Picot family. There's Charles Picot, too. Um, but Tourt was really the first. Um, Tourt bows are very, very valuable. And um, there, he was like the first person to um, really, he was like the forefather of the modern bow, basically, because. Um, you know, as you know, the as you may know, the the bow and the violin, of course, have changed and developed throughout the years. And this one of, even has been changed. The, the fingerboard was length. The, the violin, I mean, has been changed. The fingerboard was lengthened and things like that because, of course, on Baroque instruments, the fingerboard was much shorter and it, like when it was actually built. So they had to do some. Um, 
some uh, adjustments to make it uh, appropriate for modern day settings like concert halls and and of course the music that was being that was being composed throughout the the last century so and the same with the, the bow it, same with the bow it also had to undergo and, some and changes same, yes I'll show you something All right. This is a transitional bow. So this is, this, there were, the bows started even shorter than this usually, okay? And this, that was like, because the, the idea was to have the violin and the bow be the same height because, of course, this is transitional, so it's not a short, but uh, so they could fit into the case, you know what I mean? So it'd be perfectly, you know, like it'd be like this Practical and Practical matters. Practical, right. Yeah. So, but now, of course, the bows are much This is the modern bow. This is the, see, it's much longer. And this, I often, I just started, I, this, I think I'm going to buy this. It's a, by a, this, is a, this was made by a, compo uh, by a composer, by a bow maker in Boston, David Hawthorne. Um, so this is a modern bow. But I mean, he, he made it. Um, some musicians, a lot of people play, like to play Bach on broke bows still and even Mozart sometimes and I'm uh, or at least just try it because it's so much different and it feels much different and it, it definitely produces a different sound and a different energy and of course these movements like the Bach was uh, dance um, you know they were partitas especially are, are dances dance movements so um, so yeah it's interesting and I'm learning to love this and I just started playing on it like a week ago but I didn't play it for you today because it's kind of hard to go back and forth because it's a very different feeling it's a very interesting oh yeah it must um, be feeling. Yeah, but, yeah. but they hold it up here usually traditionally I mean it doesn't matter whatever is comfortable for you I mean some people hold it like this but uh and it it's just a little bit lighter and of course it's lighter it's like it looks like a wand I'm gonna um but <laughs> it's it definitely looks like medieval you know or something yeah, it's very yeah, interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. but this one actually was uh like so this was even longer than the one that from the Baroque era, from Bach's period. This was probably one made around like uh, this was this would be used for like Mozart concertos and things like that, mm -hmm. which I love. So yeah, it's fun. Another question? Yes, sir. Let just let's let's let Brianna get to you so everybody can hear your question, sir. <laughs> know who the who the violin was made for and do you know who no I have no way? idea but I do know that it was played a lot uh, it's part of the Stradivari Society I believe it was one of the first instruments purchased in the Stradivari Society so that means that it's been through the hands of a lot of artists from um, I mean when this was founded which was the Stradivari Society was founded in 19 I would like to say like in the 1970s maybe I think, or six. I don't know. Maybe I'm totally wrong, um, but you can look that up. But in any way, it's been it's been um, played by a lot of people. So, but no one's kept a genealogy of it. That's a shame. Well, I'm sure somebody has, but I don't. They don't tell oh. me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I believe mean, this gentleman here had a question. He was. Uh, I saw his hand next. Mr. Goulding, I'd like to know how many hours a day you practice and what and whether your practice is both playing the violin or in other physical Forms? exercises oh that's interesting that you said that well i um i should be my goal is to practice starting um it's been like a good goal for me is three hours three hours four hours would be wonderful but that usually is a rare occurrence when that can happen three is one is great if I can get three hours in, in and that usually doesn't happen be, because of traveling and because of uh, class and because of other things which I'm going to nip in the bud so then I do have time to practice three hours every day but uh, that's right so um, but I so I'm learning um, to do that and but other things that I just am starting to do it's also you can also practice away from the instrument like you like you were bringing up and starting to do some things like that and, and think of like mentally practicing and um, that's very important and just as helpful for me at least just um, certain things like um, at least understanding the line the overall line of the piece and 
uh, the structure of the piece and studying the score and doing things like that away from the violin at this point is very important and necessary. Yeah, and when you go to play a concerto, you know, there's a lot of preparation beyond right. playing your own part. You know, right. am I listening for the flute or the clarinet right. or the other violins or whatever? Another question. Uh, okay, Br 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 Brianna's saying we're going there, so we're going there. Hi. <laughs> Have you traveled internationally and performed um, in other countries? Yes, actually. I, I'm, last year I did... Um, I did something really exciting, and I went to Tokyo and China, and that was, I mean, I went to Japan and China, but I went to Tokyo and Beijing, and um, that was really fun. And then I also played in Berlin for the first time last year, in London for the first time last year, too. Did you play in the so, egg in, in Beijing? Uh, I played at the Forbidden City Concert Hall. Oh, the Forbidden City Concert Hall. Yeah, Ooh. it was interesting. I loved Tokyo. So, so, it was, so it was a traditional old space then? It was. And oh, it was, that uh, must have been quite oh, fascinating. Oh, actually, well, no, no. I don't no. know why they call it that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was, it, I wasn't crazy about the hall, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but It happens. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was yeah, kind of, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but I loved the food. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's good. Very good, very good. Let's get another question here. We're back here, and then I'll get to you, sir, in the next. I'm, I'm interested in uh, how you can possibly do a piece like that Mendelssohn without referring to a note. Yeah. Without referring to a, a paper? You mean, like, note? Oh, well, I, let's just think about this, though. I've been doing it for years and years, and I definitely still have to refer back to it in my practicing. But... Um, but it's like when you hear something over and over again on the radio every day on your way to work, I mean, I'm sure you'd be shocked to know that you probably have it in your brain pretty uh, deeply or when you can't get it out of your head. I mean, the, these things, uh, for music especially, there's this book by Oliver Sacks called Musical Philia. It's a very interesting book. But it's interesting how the memory works, especially with music. Oh, yeah. What? Compared to, I could never memorize a Shakespeare um you know, play or anything, I would be horrified. I could. Well, you know, it's 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 in a, in a way, it's sort of like driving. Yeah. Uh, you know that uh, you know you don't look at it, you don't look it. at every street sign. Well, you can't do that in New England anyway. Yeah. What is it with you guys and your street signs? I'm still. Excuse me, I got off on a different track. Anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, have you tried to drive around out here? Never. I oh never my will. God, it's insane. They, they 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 don't have they 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 don't ever have the street sign for the street you're looking for. <laughs> You know, if you're lucky, you get the street sign for the street you're on. You're like, I, I know what street I'm on. I don't need that one. I need it anyway. Yeah. Uh, but, but, um, excuse me. Uh, but, but, uh, but when you're driving your normal route, you know, you don't look at every street sign every day. Right. You know it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a different thing, but it's not unlike that. Now, I promised this gentleman down here that we would get to him next. Well, what, what does a violinist do for exercise, especially arms and hands, for physical exercise? Ooh, that's good. Um, well, I don't, I do mostly, I mean, I just practice. I mean, it, it's just, you. it's very important to warm up with your instrument. Um, I mean, I don't do any weights or anything. I, I just, I, it's more so uh, making sure that you're in a warm enough environment when you're practicing, especially when you're that Leads to oh, just you wait. That leads oh, to just you, just you, just you wait thirty years, on the oh, warm enough. Oh, 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 the warm enough environment what? that's going to get like needs, crucial. Really? Oh my God! Oh my God! That's you think it's a it's, thing now? Oh, just you wait. I walk huh? into my studio every week for my lesson. It's like one hundred degrees in there, and I'm sweating by the. Oh, but it's good. Oh. But it's but it's better uh, than cold. Yes. That's true. It's better than cold. Cold, you like, can't deal with. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Um, but um. Yeah, so it's very important to warm up, and um, especially if you are in a cold place, I mean, then you have to warm up for more for longer because it's just you can't try to play the Mendelssohn Concerto up to tempo right at the beginning of your practice. First of all, it won't happen; it'll make you depressed, and you just it'll be frustrating. So mm -hmm. you can't do it. It's right, just not the, the, work. the proper warm ups. Exactly, that's right. That's the proper warm ups. Another, another question? Did I see another hand out here. Oh. The, uh, 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 okay, fine. We'll go there. We'll go to you first, ma'am. Uh, do you have a particular repertory that uh, repertoire that they hire you on, or uh, how do they? How does oh, your agent? Oh, there work is a repertoire list um, that you know I have a repertoire list, which, to be honest, I 
hate that idea. But it's it's it is good to know. I mean, it's good. What I'm saying is, it's good for the the orchestras to know what have an idea of what what um you know and what you've played a lot. And but at this point in my life, I um still have things that I want to learn and do and new pieces that I want to do. And so um you know the the fear is that you can't put only things that you know down because then you'll only play only things like the one hit wonder you know what I mean like that kind of thing you don't want that so I mean I don't want that I want to learn other things so um so (laughs) so uh yeah I mean it's great to put pieces that you love down and but also at the same time pieces that you don't mind playing um over and over again because some pieces you know you get tired of them and then so but Mendelssohn is something that I I don't know it just never it's a it never gets old it never gets old it's amazing it truly does I mean you know whereas Brooke concerto in G minor gets really old I put that off my yeah, repertoire. I took I it off see, my I, repertoire. No, no, no. I, know, not, I, I don't want to play it. I hear what you're saying. It's, I it's, wouldn't do a good job at it. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> sweet. It's nice, I'm, but uh, right. you know, I you it, oh, I totally. Agree? I conducted it once, and yeah. and I said I don't need to do that again. I know. <laughs> you know? That's exactly what happened you know? to me. Yeah. I, I yeah. think I was spending too much time in the practice rooms hearing everybody else and me oh, play, well, right, trying to play it. It's right, hard. It's a hard piece, but it's just it's not worth it. I don't think. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, no, I, I, I have lots of pieces like that. That you know, oh, and yeah. sometimes you'll, you'll think in advance that you'll love it. Right. Oh, that's gonna be and fun. Then, and then you do it, and you're, you're like, really like, you do it five times, and right. then maybe it takes five times, and you're like, okay, yeah, it's enough. Yeah, I, I, I have a, for a, a while. You, well, you'll, you'll, I think you'll probably develop a, a lower threshold on deciding that. You know, really? Then yeah. You, you have, you're very tough about all about that. Yeah. You know, I don't, if you I know don't what? like it the I, first time, I'm not going back. You know what? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Me too, though. Yeah. I've gotten like that too. Yeah. That's, Next year. But anytime you want to try some, anytime you want to try something new out, you can always come back oh, to Springfield and, and have a, a lovely first performance in our oh, Symphony thank Hall. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have time for one more question. One more. The gentleman over there in the vest, who is now standing up, <laughs> to make it clear. Um, this is addressed actually to you, Maestro. Uh, You started uh, discussing Mozart, and of course, the program includes Mendelssohn. And Mozart really is a wunderkind. I mean, when at four or five you play many instruments and and write music at eight, nine. Um, But I wonder if you can comment on Mendelssohn. Mm -hmm. Mendelssohn wrote two pieces. To me, they still performed constantly since he wrote them. He was 17 when he wrote Midsummer Night Dream. The overture, yes. The ov- well, it's a long no, piece. Well, no, no, no. The, the other music came, up, uh, came a number of years later. The overture was the one that he composed. Okay. Yeah. At 17. And then he wrote an unbelievable piece at 16, the octet. The octet. Mm-hmm. Which is still considered one of the, the best. And so many big composers uh, tried their hand at octets and weren't successful. And here's the 16-year-old, which is a high school kid. Right. And he's still a kid. And this is also a wonderkind, but how, how do you explain him? Oh, Good my question. God. Wow. That's wow. a great question. How do I explain that? Also, what? the Mendelssohn A Major Viola Quintet is amazing, too. And he wrote that the same year as the octet. And that's never played, like, uh, not never played. It's... Played, but not as much, and it's brilliant piece. It's really hard too. Anyway, go on. Well, you know, I I certainly can't explain genius. I can't explain, uh, and I don't mean this necessarily religiously, divine inspiration. Uh, but uh, but certainly something is to be noted about both Mendelssohn and Mozart, and I and I alluded to this a little bit that they that they grew up and Bach as well in these very nurturing families, families in which it was all. Around now, that certainly doesn't mean anybody who comes from a musical family is going to be a brilliant musician. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, it, it was in the air. It was in the very water they were drinking. And if you compare this to Beethoven, 
who certainly didn't have the same kind of nurturing uh, home from which he came, or Brahms. Uh, these are two names that we don't associate with being Wunderkinds, and we don't have a whole list of works that they wrote before they were 20 or 25 that, oh my God, we've, you know, that, that's just amazing that somebody did that. So I think uh, it definitely is a little bit part nurture, a little bit part nature, and, uh, you know, I, I oftentimes think uh, when I uh, think of the, the disastrous state of music education in the American public schools, uh, how many musical and other artistic geniuses are lost simply because somebody felt a budget cut was in order. Uh, because because without that, without some place for it to come, I don't come from a, I come from a decidedly unmusical family, uh, you know. Uh, my, when I would practice uh, Chopin or Beethoven, my dad would come and say, when are you going to learn a normal song, boy? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, but, so it was really at school that I had the opportunity to fully explore music. Uh, and if I, you know, we're in Springfield right now, going to one of the schools that have nothing. I probably wouldn't. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, I, I wish I, ha I, w I wish I had the answer uh, to why these guys were geniuses. But uh, uh, what I can say is, Saturday night at 7:30, Springfield Symphony Hall. You can hear all three of them and yeah. Caroline. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Please don't leave the stage. Brianna looks like she's coming to say something I'm to us. Normally, if we were at the symphony, we'd be giving you flowers for your wonderful performance. Well, her, not me. I, but, um, yeah, yeah. I would just give you a hug. I'll take that. But um, I don't know if anybody else noticed, it looks like you dance with your violin when oh. you play. Mm -hmm. It was like watching you dancing. Thank you. It's That's beautiful. a wonderful compliment. I mean, does anybody actually. agree with That's me? That's really nice. It's amazing. Thank you. And the I two of you together it. were phenomenal. I thank you both so much for doing this. Um, Caroline, we'd like to gift you with a sweatshirt Thank you. to it's keep so warm. Oh, Hope very you wear it good. with pride. Thank you. And um, a little token for the first. Oh, you know that, that's yes. that, you know that's perfect. She Did she you? was we were just talking about being cold. She's got that's, the Bay Path sweatshirt, and I like and, and you know coffee. I. Right, coffee. coffee. I need and coffee to sweets. kind of rev me up. Yeah. yeah. I, need, <laughs> I, need, I, need I don't think sweets. you need revving up. So, I don't okay. either. <laughs> okay. So as as Kevin said, I handed out certificates for discounts on two tickets this Saturday. If you already have tickets, give it to a friend. Pack the house. They're going to be from phenomenal on Saturday. Great event. Obviously, if you've had a taste, you're going to love it. And hopefully, you'll grab a kaleidoscope brochure on the way out. Come to my next Wednesday's panel on life after incarceration and then return later in the season for more Rhodes Talk. Thank you very much, both Great. of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you.